Uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, this very important webinar. JSI is pleased to collaborate with uh, allies, adolescent boys and young men, adolescent girls and young women, and other key stakeholders to discuss a very important issue of gender-based violence. My name is Dr. Pamela Dongo. I work with JSI's HIV and Infectious Disease Center as a senior technical advisor. At this juncture, I'd like to hand it over to Ms. Tiwana to introduce herself and carry on with the webinar. Thank you. Good morning, you. good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good. My name is Tijuana James, and I'm the Senior Youth Advisor in the Youth Branch of the Office of HIV and AIDS at USAID, and I will be co-moderating this session. So over to my co-moderator. Thank you so much, Tijuana. I'm really excited to be here as well as a co-moderator with you, as we are going to be discussing our various issues to do with adolescent boys and young men, as well as how to end uh, sexual gender-based violence. Uh, so, and if I can introduce myself, my name is Mlamu Lisvanda from Zimbabwe, and I'm 31 years old. I'm a skills normies, no facilitator, and I've been uh, for, uh, formally engaged with Abantwana Zimbabwe as we piloted the skills normies, no uh, program. And so in short, the Skills Nominates Now program, it's a sports-based uh, violence prevention uh, curriculum uh, that is aimed at uh, reducing sexual violence uh, in boys and also equipping them with uh, various uh, critical skills to, uh, to question some gender norms and some uh, societal uh, perspectives, as well as uh, promoting uh, positive masculinities. And so for me, uh, I was really excited because I'm a soccer-loving fan and I'm, a, I'm very passionate about soccer. And so it was uh, an opportunity for me to be involved uh, with uh, the Skills Project because it also involves a lot of soccer activities. And I'm also a, a holder of a degree in uh, human resources management, which I attained in 2018 at Lupani State University. But as we all know that jobs are hard to come by in Zimbabwe, so for me, I was really lucky enough to be engaged with Bantuana Zimbabwe. And I've, I feel I've really enjoyed uh, my work. And I'm actually looking forward to the conversations that we're going to have uh, today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emla Muli. Thank you. And once again, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for what is really the second in a series of webinars um, addressing issues affecting adolescent boys and young men. If you joined us for the previous webinar, What About Boys and Young Men, Missed Opportunities in HIV Prevention and Treatment, you know that these discussions have been quite lively and informative. And I believe we'll have a um, video and audio of that previous session in the chat. You can take a look at it at your leisure. If you join that first session, then you have come to expect that the young people we have assembled for this discussion today are dynamic, purpose-filled, and committed to the work of ending HIV and gender-based violence. And they're committed to promoting positive masculinity. So again, you will find that previous session in the chat. So I thought as a way to start this morning, we have a few poll questions. Sarah, would you mind sharing the poll? And we have three questions today as they start to come up. One is um, an average of what percentage of adolescent girls and young women ages 15 to 24 report intimate partner violence? If you can put your responses in the poll. The second question is, adolescent boys and young men face high rates of gender-based violence and are often exposed to physical violence in their communities. True or false? And the last question is, the experience of blank, and we'd ask you to fill in the blanks, is a factor that can lead to an increase in gender-based violence. So if you would put your answers in and we'll be able to see them momentarily. Okay, Sarah, let me know when we're ready to share the results.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. So for our first um, poll question, an average of what percentage of adolescent girls and young women ages 15 to 24 report intimate partner violence? And the answer is 30%. So I see many of you, about 50% of our audience got that one correctly. Um, the key word here, I would say, is reported. According to a 2019 UN study, approximately 49% of women worldwide who experience domestic abuse never report their cases and never seek help. This suggests that we have a lot of work yet to do around sensitization, and creating an environment where people are both free to report and support it through a range of programs and services once they do report. Our second question is, adolescent boys and young men face high rates of gender-based violence and are often exposed to physical violence in their communities. And I see that 94% of the audience has agreed that that is a true statement. Adolescent boys and young men can in fact suffer from the impacts of gender-based violence in various ways, many of which can have a long lasting impact on their lives. Exposure to gender-based violence can affect the physical, psychological, and sexual health of young men, as well as their self-esteem, their ability to work effectively, and their ability to make decisions, especially those related to fertility and reproductive health issues. And then our last question is the experience of blank can fact, uh, is a factor that can lead to an increase in gender-based violence. So some of the responses might include poverty, war and conflict, displacement, substance abuse, and we all know the role that substance abuse and use, particularly alcohol and other drugs can play in accelerating and exacerbating gender-based violence, stress or violence in the home, um, a lack of access to information and services. Uh, and in some cases, the social acceptance of violence. All of these are factors that can contribute to increases in gender-based violence. Thank you so much for um, participating in the poll today. Now that we have laid the foundation for our discussion, in the tradition of nothing for us without us, the voices of several young men and young women will be elevated today as they help us examine ways in which adolescent boys and young men can be engaged in the battle against gender-based violence as educators, as advocates, and as allies. They will also help us better understand ways in which positive notions of masculinity can be supported and reinforced to create a world in which both young women and young men are free to live productive lives and experience healthy interpersonal relationships. Again, if you joined us previously, you will also recall that participants on the call asked for more time for these important conversations and we have listened. So as a result, today's webinar will take place over 90 minutes. So grab your first and maybe your second cup, cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and be informed. I'm again delighted today to have my co-moderator joining me. So as we begin, um, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share a bit about who you are, where you're from, some of your passions and interests, and what you have learned or gained from the work you have been doing. And let's start with Frederick. Frederick, please share a bit about yourself with us. Thanks, Tijana. I'm Frederick Ekofoli, a proud ambassador uh, for Life Relief Foundation on gender-based violence, implementing partners of the Care Continued Project Ghana. I am dedicated to raise awareness of gender-based violence and how it can be prevented as well. So I've been a great honor today. And I would say I've been able to learn a lot from my ambassadorial role and then also from uh, programs I've been attending on HIV. I've been able to attain more knowledge what's 
breaks HIV and then how it can be prevented as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Frederick. Um, next, we'd like to hear from Chief Dacamela. Can you please share a bit about yourself with us? Uh, my my name is uh, Mbusi Dacamela uh, from Mukai, Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm a traditional leader, uh, but being a traditional leader is not by profession, it's by birth. Uh, and I've, I've, I'm, I've, I've been engaged with the different organizations, including Mandwana Zimbabwe, uh, in, in trying to fight the gender-based violence and also how to improve the livelihoods of uh, young women and also uh, the men, <laughs> the young boys uh, as a traditional leader. Thank you so much, and we're indeed um, honored to have you join us today. Um, next, Latavo, please tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Latavo Meti. I'm 23 years old. I'm a peer ambassador at Shout It Now. Shout It Now is a local South African organization that has partnered with DREAMS to offer HIV and gender-based violence services for adults and girls and young women residing in South Africa. Uh, my role as a peer ambassador is to encourage adults and girls and young women to make better sexual, sexual health choices and uh, empower them with information and uh, make them aware of the services that they have in uh, the, they have access to I'm sorry um, my role is important because as a, a young woman myself it's easier for AGYW to relate to me and open up about sexual health related issues because it's not always easy to open up to someone older since uh, sex, sex and sexual health isn't exactly an open discussion at our homes thank you Thank you so much. And last but not, not least, we'd like to hear from Layla. Please share with us. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. My name is uh, Layla Milani. I'm the program director for global policy and advocacy uh, at Futures Without Violence, an organization, a social justice organization that's based out of the United States. Our offices are in San Francisco and in Washington, DC. I'm based out of Washington, DC. It's really an honor to be among such incredible youth uh, leaders and advocates of gender equality. I'm really humbled to be here and what a great uh, moderator we have as well. Just a couple of quick things. Um, I am a mother of three athletes. My favorite sport is soccer or football. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan. I don't know if you're going to hold that against me, uh, but you know, if you're if you're my friend, you will never walk alone. Um, I love the model uh, using sports as a as an entry point. Um, specifically, I love the game of football, and I think there's so much to be learned in that space. The way the um, uh, the sport, the rules of the game, the engagement with the players, uh, the role of uh, coming together as a team, um, all of that to me is just really instructive in how a lot of lessons can be learned in life. And so the work I do for Futures in terms of one of the pieces of my work, which is the Coaching Boys into Men program, we're going to talk about it in a little bit, has taught me a lot. Um, in terms of the travel that I've done in a lot of African countries and work that I've seen done with young boys, uh, adolescent boys. And the main lesson I've learned is that we're all basically created noble, boys and girls. Uh, it doesn't, you know, and the intent of every individual is really to grow up healthy and live um, healthy, productive lives. It's a matter of the, how we go about creating the best environments. Um, so that's all I wanted to share. And thank you so much for the opportunity. 
Thank you, Layla. And to just continue the soccer reference for a bit, I'm happy to be joining you all from the host of the recent Africa Cup, Cote d'Ivoire, and the winners of that cup too. So I'm sure that they will all be, be very pleased to hear me give them a little shout out. So thank you all again. So my first question today is for Frederick. Um, when young boys witness their mothers, sisters, and other female family members experiencing gender-based violence, it can have a profound and long-lasting impact on their own well-being and development, as we uh, shared in the poll. We know that gender-based violence has a family and is a family and community problem that affects us all, although perhaps in different ways. We may be familiar with the saying that hurt people hurt people, meaning that witnessing GBV can result in the perpetuation of violence. Can you share your insights on the specific challenges and traumas that young boys who witness or experience violence face? And what strategies can be employed to support them and to break the cycle of violence? Uh, in other words, how can we ensure that interventions are designed to support women and girls, but also address the needs of young boys who are also both survivors and witnesses of violence? Frederick? Good question, Tijana. I'll first of all tackle what the young boys witness on gender based violence. Firstly, adolescent boys or young boys who witness gender-based violence in their homes, mostly internalized to adapt the violence that they have witnessed. Long, not long, long ago, I was a victim. I tend to you know, adapt such violence by my dad because I thought in all he was strengthening or correcting my mom, of which true life relief foundation, I got to know it wasn't a true. Now, adolescent boys also go through uh, issues with self-esteem, strapping and also forming a healthy relationship when they witness gender-based violence. In order for us to make sure that we have solved this between them, we ought to educate these young boys about healthy relationships, consent, and then gender equality, and how to resolve conflicts for them to understand the dynamics of gender-based violence and also develop a positive attitude towards its preventions. Young boys also go through uh, shame, uh, low self-esteem and also stigma and tend to withdraw themselves from any social networking and any social activities as well because they have the fear that when they go into places, they are going to be pointing Hands or fingers on them, as in, see, this boy, his dad is always beating. Uh, Frederick, maybe you can turn off your camera. We're starting to lose your sound. Okay. While we try to adjust um, this, I wanna move on. But first I want to highlight a few things that Frederick has already said. One is he talked about young boys internalizing the violence that they witness. And I think that's such an important point that we don't want to lose. And I'd like to even thank him for sharing his personal experience that relates to that. Frederick, I see you're back now. Do you Would you like to continue your remarks? Like I was saying, The fear, shame, and a low self-esteem and stigma associated with gender-based violence in the family lead to social withdrawal. Okay. Thank you again. Um, so just another point that I'd like to pick up on, um, and, and that was that you expressed a need for young people to see healthy relationships, to see models of healthy relationships. And I think that's another important point um, and a role in a place where male role models and others can really help our young people to understand what a healthy relationship looks like and the fact that violence is not um, necessary in a healthy relationship. I'm going to move on now to Chief Dacamella. Um, I am so excited to have you on this call today as a community leader. 
And I imagine that you might find yourself sort of between two worlds. Um, one that honors the customs and traditions of your community, while at the same time trying to facilitate change among elders and others for whom change may be difficult and, and honestly sometimes frightening. We know that transforming gender norms and promoting healthy masculinity is crucial in eliminating gender-based violence and that the community is key to this change. So can you please share with us what are some of the strategies and best practices that have been effective in engaging adolescent boys and young men as allies in the movement to end gender-based violence? And tell us a bit about how we can elicit the support of more young men to become champions of gender equality within their communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for the opportunity. Uh, and the, the question that you have just posed uh, in terms of difficulties in, of transforming uh, when we are entrenched in, in the customs uh, and traditions of our society uh, and the strategies that can be adopted in terms of uh, increasing the number of young adolescents uh, in terms of fighting the gender-based violence. Um, I, I think uh, what is crucial in, in, in this issue in terms of the customs and traditions uh, and uh, it, it is to actually acknowledge that the customs and, and the traditions that we live in, they are indeed uh, also uh, flexible uh, as much as we think they are rigid. Uh, but it depends how we introduce whatever we want to introduce in a certain society or in a community. So all these things that are coming to say we have to deal with gender-based violence as communities and also as the traditions and values, uh, the values of our tradition or the values of our communities, they also acknowledge that gender-based violence is not a good thing. And also, you know, when we 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 are identifying the causes of 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 gender based violence, I know we we usually uh, uh, point out the issues to do with patriarchy, and also uh, in our societies, in rural societies where we come from, we know that we have patriarchal societies, but uh, the patriarchal societies they are built in a sense that they defend and protect the women, they defend and protect the girl child. Uh, so whenever gender-based violence happens, it is not credited to the patriarchal societies, the values and the norms of the community. So I, I want us to actually uh, look at it that way and say, that is not the, the, the departing point where we say gender-based violence is uh, actually, actually comes from that, but the strategies that can be used now is to, uh, is to. I, I love uh, the, the the way you opened the, this uh, this platform where we spoke about uh, what about the boy child, you know, because uh, the 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 emergence of uh, elevating or uh, the 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 focus on the girl child also it a bit of negative impact because we were leaving uh, so much boys and also focusing on the gender that we feel are the victims of gender-based violence, but also leaving those that we, we think uh, are, the, are, the, are the perpetrators uh, of, of, of gender-based violence. So whenever we sit in a traditional society, whenever we are dealing with issues, it is equally important to say the victim and the perpetrator should come in front or they should come to the table. Then we engage both of them. We identify the things that are the causes of whatever is happening, in this case, the gender-based violence. So it is important that we, we, we enroot uh, the, 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 the strategies of fighting gender-based violence in the early stages. For example, let's say the great ones, the adolescent young, uh, young, young children, the adolescents, both young girls, okay, both boys and girls. We should not be choosing to say the girls are the oppressed ones or the girls are the abused ones. 
but remember it takes a, a maybe we, we can only say this is a this is a man or a woman after 11 to 12 13 years but before 11 years we all see they, they are just the same. The strength is the same. The masculinity is the same. The strength of a girl and a boy child is the same. So at, at those early stages, we should insert uh, this, whatever uh, the strategies that we want so that they know that a, a boy should be the one who defends their counterparts. Also, the girl should respect and protect their counterparts. It appears your video has frozen. Let's see. Maybe if you turn off your camera, we aren't hearing you well right now. They won't be any uh, gender. They are the same. So we should... Uh, are, we, are we good to go now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Yes. As I was saying, I was saying uh, we, we should use an inclusive approach at the early stages, at the adolescent stage, where they don't see gender, where they only see their peers. So we entrench all the knowledge that we want to teach them at those early stages to say, uh, you guys are, are there for each other, you should protect each other. The, then when we entrench that, they won't see any gender coming uh, going forward because the adolescents are our future and also when they they grow up knowing what we want like that uh, there's no there should be there shouldn't be any gender in inequalities uh, when they grow up that's how they will also teach their peers that's how they will treat each other and as a result we will have a, a gender equal society so I think uh, those are the things Oh, that is the approach I think it should we should take being inclusive because what I, I saw uh, when we when we we we, we ran with the, the girl child we gave we gave them uh, opportunities like uh, school opportunities uh, we gave them opportunities in terms of projects we gave them many opportunities and also let's remember that gender-based violence does not only come natural that this one is a man, this one is a, is a woman. It also depends on the education that the, the people are getting. So when we are uh, elevating the girl child to be educated, to be given opportunities in terms of projects, remember the gender-based violence also comes from unemployment, uh, the education, the, those who are not educated at times, they do not understand those things. They do not argue with logic and facts. They only like argue with masculinity, who hence becomes the negative masculinity. So I think that is the approach that I would say. And thank you for, for the opportunity. I will end there for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing those um, perspectives. I think I heard a number of things in your remark that I just want to um, make sure that we highlight. And one is that um, customs and culture is flexible. And I think sometimes we forget that it is not rigid. It does change with the times. And so change is possible. And it also opens us up to perhaps new opportunities. Um, the way you introduce topics and subject matters in communities is key. And I think that is a very important lesson learned and where um, leaders like yourself can really play an instrumental role in helping us gain access to community so that we can then focus on one of your other points, which is starting early and providing access to information and, and education for young people. And I would say that's really important for both young boys and young girls, because I have been in focus groups where I've he heard young girls say, if I'm not physically abused by my boyfriend or if he doesn't hit me as a result of some action I may have taken, I feel like he doesn't love me. And I think these kinds of beliefs can be really deeply rooted in, in uh, not only in culture, but in community and the way communities are organized. So I think education for both our young boys and girls is important. And then the last point I wanted to highlight is that 
patriot that violence is not a feature of patriarchal societies that these societies are designed to defend and protect and i think that's another important point and perhaps we can look more at how do we use that foundational principle to help change the paradigm in the way communities are are um interacting with one another around issues related to violence. So thank you again so much, um, our two panelists, for your feedback. And I'm going to turn it over to Imla Muli. Over to you. Thank you, Tiwana. Um, and also thank you to Chief Daramela for the insight. I mean, I really concur with most of the things that you really mentioned. So uh, if you can also hear from Frederick, I mean, like, uh, teaching young boys, uh, I mean, to question gender norms, uh, as well as promoting positive masculinity. I really think it's possible and I really think it's achievable. But I think also it takes time and it takes uh, a lot of time for, for them to grasp uh, these concepts. So in, in, my question is, are there any other things, I mean, are there any other strategies or best practices that we can uh, uh, we can use to engage these adolescent boys and young men, and like how can we really empower them uh, to become gender champions uh, yeah, of equality within their communities? So, thank you. Uh, first of all, where do we get these adolescent boys and young men? It is the school, the community organizations, and then most of them are, are in youth organizations. So we first ought to partner with these schools, youth organizations, and then other community stakeholders to help us reach a larger audience of adolescent boys and young men. After doing this, we take them through education and awareness. We provide them comprehensive awareness on human rights, gender equality, and then healthy relationship to help them understand the root causes of gender-based violence and their roles in preventing it. This education and awareness can be through training and also peer-to-peer -peer discussions as well. After doing this, we hope to empower these adolescent boys and young men to become peer educators and ambassadors to, and also advocate for gender equalities within their communities. I will always use myself as an example. It's through Life Relief Foundation that I go to know more, most of the things related to gender-based violence, and then also empowered me to become a peer educator and also an ambassador in my community as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Frederick. Uh, very well said. And I mean, if we can all put our heads together, I think most of uh, what you have mentioned is actually achievable. And also not forgetting to mention, uh, 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 equal, I mean, funding. Uh, so maybe if we, I can also uh, go back to uh, uh, Chief Taramela. I mean, uh, so many oftentimes we've uh, always talked more about uh, negative uses of masculinity, such as uh, men have power of uh, women. And uh, Usually, men exercise power in households or even uh, during relationships or even in decision making. So, I wanted to know from you, Chief, are there any other ways, uh, I mean, uh, more positive uses of um, our masculinity as men, I mean, to do better in our communities? No, uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Mlamuli Swanda. Uh, uh, like I introduced uh, earlier on that uh, patriarchy, uh, you know, it is defined by masculinity, by uh, the, the male uh, prowess. Uh, however, uh, I also mentioned that it is important to note that uh, patriarchy, like I'm trying to also answer your question that how can we use our masculinity positively? Uh, when we look at patriarchy, uh, the societies, the values and principles of our society, we know that a man is a provider. Provision, however, well, uh, also women provide. But by the structures of our patriarchy, it meant that a uh, man uh, should uh, provide and provision was derived from the masculinity. 
and also men should uh, should protect their women should protect their families and also that is derived from the masculinity hence the question that is how can we then utilize the masculinity positively those are the features that you find in the patriarchy however we we have those people who have then uh, uh, utilized uh, the masculinity negatively and those we, we, we should then say it, it is not uh, credited to, to, to the traditional norms and values and the masculinity. Being masculine does not mean someone should abuse anyone. Being masculine does not mean uh, someone should uh, oppress anyone. Remember, we have, even when we look at men, we have men who are more masculine than others. We have men who even abuse other men because of their masculinity. But I want to say it is not because of the masculinity, but it is because of a certain disability. It may be in their brains or somehow. Because masculinity does not mean someone should oppress anyone. So we have to look at uh, these things. I remember there was a statement that was said by our by uh, Tiwana uh, James that uh, someone who's hit. Hate what? What? Someone who's hate usually hate other other people. So we have mm -hmm. some 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 history of of people who've been hurt because of because they've been exposed to 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 such experiences and also uh, because of remember uh, maybe if we go to our areas where you know here in Africa we have more rural areas uh, it is rural populated. We have people in rural areas, there is lack of employment. And if someone is to get money, they do hard labor. And also uh, because of lack of in employment, there is also lack of entertainment. So some, because of lack of employment, lack of schools, and they're not employed too, then they, they, they then resort to alcohol. Uh, well, there's a, a, a less uh, drug abuse in rural areas, but they resort to uh, uh, alcohol abuse. So those people, because of the post trauma uh, trauma that maybe they've uh, they've gone through, and also because of unemployment, and also because of uh, because they did not go to school, and also because they are coming from families which did not teach them well in terms of how to treat other people. They then use the masculinity in a negative way. And therefore, I think because the way I structured the, 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 pat the patriarchal society that men are meant to provide, men are meant to protect, men are meant to be men, men are meant to be heroes, and also they are meant to, you know, to, to, to be models, to be role models in a community. That's why leadership was meant to have a, a, a a main that they say leadership is a main face because the characteristics of a leader should be honesty, integrity, you know, respect of, of, of other people, protecting other people. So all these things that are coming uh, to our communities where men are, are abusing, where we have child uh, marriages, where we have rapes, that is also foreign to our community. That is also foreign to our society. So I'm happy we're having this webinar where we are discussing these things, trying to find out how we can work together to actually uh, uh, reduce these effects. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Chief. Uh, I mean, you really mentioned a lot of uh, points there. And um, I really hope everyone who's listening right now has taken each and, and uh, I mean, is uh, taken a point uh, each. And I really wish we could also uh, try as men to like use um, more uh, positive uh, uh, aspects of our masculinity in trying to do more in our communities and even embracing women as part of us, uh, as part of people that we live with. So with that, I'll hand it over back to Tiawana. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is for Latabo. Um, while this conversation is about adolescent boys and young men, we know that the lives of young men and young women are inextricably linked. 
So we really like to hear your thoughts on this conversation. They are important and are welcome. From your perspective as a young woman who interacts with other adolescent girls and young women, what role do you think adolescent boys and young men can play in keeping girls safe and eliminating gender-based violence? Okay, um, it is very crucial for adolescent boys and young men to understand what gender-based violence is and the effects that it has on adolescent girls and young women. So, um, I've broken it down into three parts of what they can do to protect women from gender-based violence. The first being getting informed. They should first look at how their mothers, their sisters, their grandmothers are treated by men and wonder if they were put in the same position, how would they feel? And if they're uncomfortable about it, they should look into getting to understand what gender-based violence is by looking into finding different organizations that work on educating men about gender-based violence um, and that getting information, they will also learn that gender-based violence isn't on only physical, it is also um, uh, mental, emotional, and financial. Secondly, get empowered. Now that they have the right information, they can surround themselves with surround themselves with like-minded people and uh, join mentorship programs, find positive role models. And with these groups, they will be able to become advocates of gender-based violence. And being advocates means that they will also be able to inform other young men about gender-based violence, uh, uninformed young men about gender-based violence and empower other men about gender-based violence and in turn also becoming a positive role model to their peers. Um, I have a personal story of how I saw all of this come into play. Um, growing up, I lived with my grandmother and we were, we were all female in the house and I'd spend most of the time with my grandmother. And she used to say that there are certain rules that are expected of women. So women are primarily expected to be the ones that cook, that clean, do laundry. Uh, those are called women, women's, uh, women's duty. And whenever I'd feel uncomfortable, I would feel like lazy, um, she would say things like, what kind of man will marry a woman that doesn't want to do her duties? And in turn, I was brainwashed uh, into thinking that is who I am. That is what is expected of me. I, this is what I am here to do. This is what I came into the world to do. Um, and then my cousin moved in after her, his mother passed away. And because he was informed and empowered, he didn't see the gender roles that uh, society has given us. He didn't mind helping me washing the dishes or cleaning. And that empowered me and showed me and taught me that we are all equals. There isn't specific roles set on two different people because society has put us in boxes that determine who we are and who we are to become. He broke that for me. He taught me that we are all equals, we are all human beings, and we don't need to be stuck with all of these societal norms and stereotypes. And in that, I was empowered. He is my advocate. Um, so to answer your question, um, for adolescent boys and young men to play a role in gen in putting a stop in gender-based violence, they could get informed, uh, get empowered, and also become advocates for women facing gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Latabo. Um, I love the way young people are always so clear and to the point about what is needed. They're always very solution oriented. And I think I hear from you a recurring theme and that is around information and education. 
Um, several panelists have mentioned that, so I think that's an important um, entry point for us to begin to change some of these uh, behaviors. And also want to highlight the comment you made that may get lost on us sometimes, and that is that violence is not only physical, but it can also be mental, emotional, and financial. And I think those are really important points for us to highlight. So I'm going to turn it back over to my co-moderator. I want to um, continue to invite you all to put questions in either the chat. Um, and I see questions bouncing off. I see we have very lively discussions going on in the chat, and I want to uh, encourage you to continue to do that. So back over to you, M. Lamuli. OK, thank you so much. So if I can uh, take it back to Milani, uh, you say it, yeah, I saw a in fan as well. Unfortunately, I'm a Manchester United fan. <laughs> okay, so uh, back, uh, from the introduction, you mentioned something uh, about uh, coaching boys into men program. So I would really love to uh, get to know more about that. So would you really uh, I mean briefly tell us more about that? Thank you so much, even though you're a uh, Manchester United, we'll just forgive you on that note and take that argument offline. Um, but joking aside, um, thank you so much. Yeah, I would love to share a bit with you about our program because there's actually a lot of great questions in the chat about you know what are the solutions. But I, I, I would be remiss at not responding to a couple of things re related to what we're talking about uh, in terms of um, masculinities and femininities and the roles they play and um, uh, in the in building up these norms that um, sometimes could lead to violence. Um, so I wanted to um, touch on that and actually share a, a powerful quote with you to begin because I think this this back and forth uh, incredible in, uh, discussion around our traits our norms that are attributed to us brings me to this quote. Um, there is a saying from my own faith tradition and I'm a Baha'i, so I'm bringing that into it, that men and women are like the wings of the bird of humanity. If the bird, if the wings are not equal in strength, the bird will not be able to fly. And so when we're talking about these attributes that, and they're not bad, you know, uh, when the ch chief Takamela was speaking about strength and leadership and, you know, being the breadwinners, all of those are, are attributes. There's nothing wrong with any of those. Caretaking, compassion, uh, love, motherhood, all of those types of attributes are also positive. They all play a role in our society. And I just wanted to share, as I go through to tell you a bit more about coaching boys into men, when we do the training of this program, that's an evidence-based program focused on dating and sexual violence prevention, um, we designed certain types of sessions and content in there. And one of those uh, 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 approaches that we have. We ask all those in the room, all the men that are the coaches that will be working with the athletes as they implement the program to write down three attributes that they ascribe to model men in their society. So what is it that, and everyone on this call can do this exercise as we're talking about this. What are the three top attributes that you think of when you think of a model man or a man in our communities? And we've done this, Coaching Boys to Men has done this kind of an exercise with its uh, participants in the US hundreds of times and in over nine African countries and in the Far East, in India. Um, and the answers are incredible. They're not really culturally based uh, as while, while we're talking about culture here, because we can pull those answers out and show you that they match from country to country, from religion to religion. And those are things like, uh, we tend to uh, think of a man as a breadwinner. We think of a man as someone who's strong, who's someone who's courageous, who is in position of authority. When we ask the same question about what are the attributes that you see in women that are a model that our societies value, again, we see an overlap. It's the same things we say, whether we're in Lesotho or in Tanzania 
or in India or in Chicago, Illinois, USA, we're saying things like uh, women are compassionate, are caring, uh, are loving, are supportive. So you see that this actually transcends even culture. But when you take these attributes and put them aside, one thing that we, I notice, and we go into this conversation with our students, our participants, is that when you just take one, the male attributes by themselves or the female attributes by themselves, there's a lot left behind. Why can't a woman be courageous? Why can't a woman be leader? Why can't a man be compassionate and caring? And no one's saying they can't. In fact, what we wanna do is build communities that strengthen those attributes in our young boys and young girls, right? So that those are the foundations of these healthy, healthy relationships because the person is healthy. The person is confident in who they are. And we're not necessarily doing a favor to the young men where all the attributes we're putting on them are kind of a pressure. They're creating a pressure cooker on them that you are the only one with the responsibility to have courage, to bring in the money, to, to lead the community. And that we're not gonna value and we're not gonna ascribe the value of compassion and care to you. So uh, sensitivity, those it's not that we don't see it in man, what we want to do is we want to encourage all of it in both young girls and young boys. And as we do that, I'm going to walk into this, the model, the, the training that was the original question about coaching boys into men. What we want to do in this context and the goal of CBIM is, this, is to invite, it's an appeal to inviting men as opposed to indicting men. We want to be partners in this work. We want young boys to be nurtured in an environment where as much as their leadership and courage and strength is promoted, so is their compassion, their ability to form strong relationships and healthy relationships. So we want to meet men, and that's the model we use in Coaching Boys Into Men. Um, uh, you know, we take on the role of coaches. We use the powerful and influential role of coaches in our communities as they engage with young men, because we know that, and our work has proven, our over a decade's worth of work in CBIM has proven that young boys and girls look up to uh, the role models in co their communities, and those role models tend to be coaches, tend to be teachers, tend to be someone who is a, um, not necessarily their parent, but plays a role in their lives. And so in the space of the, you know, since sports is such a big part of our community, CBIM went into that space to tap into the, that environment where there is a lot of opportunity for young boys to engage with the, their coaches. And in this space, we call on the man, young man, to be a role model, to be leaders, but to um, advance qualities and attributes that really make the child whole. And by that, I mean, strengthen all of their skills and all of their attributes. So this, we move away from this notion of men are the, men are the aggressors in a bad way, that they're the, only, they're the problem. So we don't want them as part of the solution. In fact, we want them in, we want them on the same team. We want the men and, you know, men and boys, women and uh, girls, to be on the same team to work together. And so this role of inviting men um, to take on specific actions, to be part of the solution, and in this contest, to stand up against violence against uh, in their communities is really important. And through these trainings, we try to empower men with the tools that they need to uh, be successful on how to stand, be upstanders, how to, and these are kind of the objectives of CBIM is to increase, you know, identify and increase knowledge of uh, what would constitute an abusive behavior. So let's say if in our communities it's normal or it's a practice to promote strength, strength is good, but where does strength become violence, right? To be able to identify that. It's good to be a leader, but when does that leadership uh, turns into bullying? You know, be able to identify those things and make sure that the youth, that the athletes can distinguish. We like to increase in this program uh, 
uh, attitudes that promote gender equality and equity. Have those conversations through these sessions that we hold with the coaches who then deliver the, the training to the athletes. And then we like to create uh, greater intentions on the role we play and the young men play in being leaders in advancing positive um, uh, relationships where they can be upstanders, not just bystanders. And then finally, another important aspect of what we like to advance in coaching boys into men is to decrease the abusive behavior, not just between boys and girls, but just in the community as, you know, as a rule. And what we found is as we've done this work over decades, and we have had data points returned to us and analysis of the learning that has been done over the years, we learned that and we've even, you know, we have interviews with parents that say, hey, you know, my son, before he did CBIM, he wasn't listening to me at home. He wasn't doing his homework. He was disrespectful. And some of those things you say, that's not really about gender. It's really just a, a behavior pattern that not only are they forming better skill sets to be better partners in life with girls potentially, but also be better individuals as a whole in their family and in their community. So those are the, the key objectives of coaching boys into men. Um, and they're, um, you know, I think I've spoken a lot and I don't want to take too much time so I can pause there. But basically, you know, the goal is to build healthy relationship to prevent violence, but to really promote um, uh, young men to find themselves and be happy with who they are, as opposed to identifying only as perpetrators. And I end with this note that um, most men are not abusive, although we know that most of the abuse taken place against women are by, conducted by men. Most men in our society are not abusive. Okay, thank you so much, Leila. Ah, that was fascinating. And I think you've actually even answered the, the other question that I had for you. But uh, for the sake of our viewers, I think I'll just ask it anyway, and uh, maybe you can answer also briefly. Uh, uh, it's like uh, from the work that you have done around the world, uh, what have you learned that you would uh, advocate for the programs and donors uh, to address in and the policies uh, to address gender-based violence? Like in what areas uh, should implementing partners uh, be concentrating their efforts on adolescent boys and young men programming? That was for me too, right? Just making sure. Yes. Yes. So I yeah, know. we've done we we've done this uh, in the U.S. for over a decade and we've been um, systematically implementing um, CBIM in a lot of African countries over the past five, six years. So we've learned a lot and I would love to speak to what are the important pieces, takeaways in terms of our learning is. One is this work has to be sustainable and not a one and done. Uh, in order to really build a community that adheres to these, uh, this practice. We can't just go in and work with nine to 14 year olds for a very small window of time and then be, leave the space. This has to build, this has to continue. And there's an important piece to this work, which is always evaluating it, always reviewing its outcome and always taking feedback from those who are supposed to benefit from it. Um, to be humble, really for, for those who are implementing it, for us who've developed the program, uh, to be humble in, the, in that we have a lot, as much to learn from the students, from the coaches as, as we have to give. And our program can only be as good as we're responsive to the community we serve. So that's one of the key lessons. Um, I think that we see a trend now with both, uh, you know, I, I work, in the United States, and I do a lot of ad advocacy around increasing US's commitment to resources globally to address gender-based violence. I see a trend in US's commitment, and I see a trend in even private donors that want to see the money go into the um, civil society organizations in countries on the ground to really strengthen their abilities to do work as opposed to a third party, a bigger organization coming in. And I commend that. 
at the same time that I commend that, that work needs to be done in a timely fashion. It, we can't just completely all of a sudden turn around tomorrow until um, or implementing partners on the ground. Oh, we've been here for four years. You, we're out. You are on your own. To do that partnership over time and systematically so that the our partners on the ground don't feel abandoned overnight. And if if that is to take place, if um, and that is a welcome thing. And I think we actually advocate for that. We, you know, it's the teaching how to fish, not to just give the fish, right? The old adage goes, but to then support the local organization with the funds they need to build out this capacity that's sustained so that, you know, it may look like if we take out the bigger players, we can save some funds and uh, we're not necessarily sharing some of that funds with the local partners. I think the local partners should be given the resources they need to strengthen their skill set. So that's another, you know, takeaway I wanted to share. Um, um, so those are the the two main lessons I think that are really important. If there are funders out there that are hearing us, um, to to kind of kind of consider this. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Leila. Well, I, I just had to ask that question uh, just because of uh, there's so many uh, stakeholders who are tuning in right now. So I hope everyone was taking note uh, and taking some notes actually. Uh, so back to you, uh, Tiwana. Thank you. And so I, I have the privilege of asking the final two questions, but I want to continue to encourage people to put questions in the chat. I see we're having a very lively discussion there, so we may not be able to get to all of those questions, but my hope is that um, the team at JSI will take a look at them and they can send some responses when they send out um, the follow-up email to this webinar. So, so my question is for Frederick again from Ghana. Most discussions of GBV are skewed towards females and rightfully so as they represent the majority of survivors. However, males as, as we have been discussing can also be survivors of violence, but their pain can often go unnoticed. And they may also face additional challenges when reporting and seeking services. I think someone mentioned early the issue of stigma. Um, what has been your experience with male survivors of violence in your work with adolescent boys and young men? What challenges do they face and how can they be helped? That's for you, Frederick. Thank you. Despite the fact that gender-based violence is always centered on the experiences of females, doesn't mean adolescent boys and young men don't go through gender-based violence. In fact, they also face gender-based violence and they also become a survivor. But the challenge is when reporting it to seek help, they find problem in it. Upon my interaction with adolescent boys and young men, I observed that many of them fear to report uh, incidents on gender-based violence because they think they are going to be judged and also not being taken serious. And then also in Ghana here, our gender stereotype I think we lost your sound, Frederick. Don't report it. Because after all, you are strong and brave, of which it is not true. It can never be true as well. They also uh, tend to take the blame themselves, uh, saying that if I haven't or I didn't, you know, uh, attack this person or uh, come into an agreement with this person, she wouldn't have violated my my life or my rights. They also fear that their abuser will retaliate against them after reporting the case as well which it prevent them uh, in seeking for help and also uh, social support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, we lost a bit of your sound, but I think um, two of the points I picked up, as I mentioned before, the issue of stigma um, when reporting and also the fear of retribution. I think that was a really important point as well that we haven't discussed yet. 
Um, thank you very much for that feedback. And so then my um, last question is for the chief. Um, what opportunities are there for working with traditional institutions to address some of the norms and values that propagate gender-based violence? And I would like to ask if you could also speak a bit to religion. I noticed in some of the comments in the chat, there was reference to the role of religion in also perpetuating some of these notions about violence. So can we hear from you again, please? And that was for um, yeah. Chief Dr. No, no. Yes. Sorry, can you rephrase your, your question, please? Thank you. If you could help us understand or learn about opportunities for working with traditional institutions, as well as religious institutions to address some of the norms and values that kind of support and perpetuate gender-based violence. No, uh, th thank you for 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 that important question and the last question, and <laughs> uh, uh, the the opportunities uh, of of working with the traditional institutions and also working with the religious institutions uh, in terms of uh, uh, reducing uh, gender based violence. Uh, I think because uh, in in our society, uh, traditional leadership are the leaders of the people, and they 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 live within the grassroots of the people, and same applies to the religious leaders. They understand uh, so many uh, dynamics and how people live in the in the society or in the community. So uh, on that on its own, it is a, a, an opportunity uh, to engage them uh, to, to, to try and address the issues to do with their gender-based violence. Because most of these things, sometimes when someone is, uh, someone is abused, maybe let's say a woman is abused by their husband, what usually happens, they also come to traditional leadership. Uh, when anything happens, some they 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 go and uh, seek comfort on their religious leaders or the pastors. So that means because of the their proximity to the grassroots, the traditional leadership, and also the religious leaders, it simply means they know what is happening in the society. So, for example, there are so many. Uh, maybe if the statistics, there are so many. Uh, there are so many issues where some of the uh, victims could go maybe to a traditional leader, and then maybe some of the traditional leaders they just suppress that issue. Maybe it's something that has to go to the to the police uh, so that someone is apprehended, and then they serve or serve their sentence. But it is also it, it is then uh, reported to a traditional leader, and also because of the traditional leader, there are some there are family members and the likes. Then they suppress all those issues. So for 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 institutions and organizations to work with the traditional leadership and the religious leadership to conscientize and sensitize them on how to handle with these issues. For example. In rural areas, uh, that's where we find uh, early child marriage, like child marriages, a 16-year-old, a 12-year-old is married to a 50-year-old. It happens in rural areas where we have traditional leaders, where we have religious leaders. So it is important that we work, or it is an opportunity to conscientize and, uh, and sensitize these leaders because they, 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 on a daily basis, they, they are confronted with this, this situations. And also, uh, some of the opportunities is uh, uh, we, we ought to, to, to engage traditional leaders uh, at, at, at initial stages so that we, these organizations or organizations, they do not come to, uh, to convince the chiefs uh, in terms of gender-based violence and how to eradicate gender-based violence and HIV. 
but we, we sit together so that we go together to convince societies, to convince communities, because chiefs are the leaders of the communities and because of uh, the naturally people from communities, they, 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 they listen to traditional leadership. So there is acceptance when these messages are, are, are being brought by traditional leadership. So it is important that we invest more on traditional leaders. Uh, we invest, because what I have seen also in, in our areas, you see maybe, for example, some, most organizations that have to do with gender-based violence, that have to do with the HIV and AIDS, they do their memorandum of understandings, not with the traditional leaders, but they do with the, the local authorities. Maybe one would say uh, local councils, uh, these ones, some are politicians, they just come for five years, then maybe they change in the next five years. But a traditional leader uh, is there for life. As long as they are still alive, they are still there. So there's sustainability. Those are the opportunities. If we engage traditional leaders, leaders it simply means there's sustainability in our, in our approach. So I think those are the issues. And, uh, and also you, you mentioned something about values and uh, principles that, that uh, propagate gender-based violence. And I would like to think uh, there, there is no value or a, a principle, if I had to say, there, there is no uh, cultural value or uh, traditional values that propagate gender-based violence. Because let's remember, when we are speaking of values, we are speaking of something with it, something of integrity. Uh, so the, the, the traditional values are meant, those are the patriarchal uh, values where we are saying uh, we need to protect our community. We need to protect our families. We need to protect our wives. We need to protect our daughters. We need to protect all our families, including boys and, and girls. So that simply means our values are to protect our, our, our families. Our values are to protect our, our our communities also as men because in a patriarchal society that those are the masculine duties of a man where we protect we serve and and we 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 provide for our family no value or traditional value that would maybe uh, exacerbate any form of gender-based violence it always you know so i think uh, i will I will stand there. Thank you so much. And uh, okay, nice, thank you. nice okay. piece, by the way, Tiwan. <laughs> okay. Nice piece, by the way. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for all of your comments. I think um, this probably would have been a very different conversation had you not been a part of it. And so it's really um, been really delightful and also very insightful to hear from you. Um, just to highlight um, one point that you made that I think is so important, and that is to engage early at the start, not as an afterthought and also to work in partnership. So those of us from international organizations are not coming in to dictate to communities what they should be doing, but we are working in partnership with those communities to find solutions that work best in those settings. So again, I think wonderful points, not only that you have made, but all of our panelists, um, we have a couple more things that we want to do before we close out today. But first, I just want to thank everyone for all of their um, comments and feedback. And as I said, the, the chat has just been blowing up. Um, before we get to a few of the questions, we do have a call to action. So if you've been with us before, you know we'd like to leave this session with everyone who is um, participating, making a commitment to do something differently as they move forward. So our question um, for today is, how can adolescent boys and young men and adolescent girls and young women work together towards ending gender-based violence? So you can um, either take a picture of the um, QR code, or I think there's a phone number at the top that you can dial in. And if you wouldn't mind beginning to populate your responses as we move into the questions. 
Um, so again, as I said, um, the chat has been very active and um, there are a number of questions. And one that I find really interesting that we haven't talked about today is the role of social media and digital platforms in this whole conversation. As we all know, we are living in a new era where young people have access to all kinds of information, good, bad, truthful, and untruthful. And we see every day how the social media can be used for good, but how it's also being used for bad, for online bullying, for communicating negative messages. Um, some of the images that are portrayed on social media have a negative impact, and we're learning more and more as research is being done about the impact that all of this really is having, not only on the lives of our young people, but also on their brain development. So I would just like to pose a question to any panelists who would like to uh, answer. How can we address the negative um, impacts and consequences of social media? And how can we maybe redirect it so it could be used for good? Leila, I see your, your hand is going up. Would you like to answer that? Leila, sorry. I, I would love to. Um, I, I think there's two parts. There's the part of as a community and as funders actually, um, how do we enter that, that space on owning the communication and the social media platforms on this topic? And then there's another segment that I wanted to speak to as well, which is the role of communities and parents in the control they have over the, the adolescents' access to these platforms. So on the front of um, you know, social media, it's kind of like that uh, notion that you have a lot of power, use it for good or evil, choose good. So social media has a lot of power. We've seen the negative impacts. It could also be used for a very positive purpose. And one of the areas where I would love to see more investment is um, with input from those impacted, with input from those that know the subject well, is how can we message some of these positive messages about um, um, the attributes of young men and young girls, strengthening the girls, strengthening the boys and the full person that they are. We can use social media and also we can um, use social media to you know, there was a lot, I've been reading a lot of the comments about we need to start early, which I 100% agree. Uh, the sooner we start, the earlier the intervention, the earlier we enter in this discourse with our youth, the better. But what do you do? You can't just ignore the families. You can't ignore the community and the parents. So social media is some is a place where we can kind of start engaging the older community as well. Where, and I'll highlight one example that Futures Without Violence has used over the uh, in the past in a message. So in the US, Father's Day is a big deal, right? And um, sports events are big deals, especially the national events where everyone tunes in. So imagine if you're watching what, you know, is, you know, in the US, a Super Bowl Sunday, the equivalent of which would be a big, you know, Premier League final or Champions League final. And in the, um, in that space, there are messages that come to the audience about um, about the role that men, uh, fathers can play in society. So one of the ads that we aired in the United States during Father's Day was this thing called Teach Early. And so the screen opens up, uh, the, the, the commercial opens up with uh, a father and a son, a series of fathers and sons playing a sport. So, and the voice over the commercial says, you've taught him how to hit the upper 90. If you play soccer, you know what that is. You know, you shoot it up the night in the net. You've hit him how to hit the rim, which is a basketball net. You've hit, you've taught him how to hit a home run. You've, you've taught him how to hit a, you know, uh, tackle another player. So you can see there are all these messages and these pictures of these fathers and their son playing a sport and they use the word hit in a kind of a good way. You've taught him all these things in the context of sports. And then the screen goes black and it says, have you taught him what not to hit? So, you know, you've spent all this time with your, your, um, your child uh, engaging in a sport and using that time, you also need to instruct him and guide him on what is appreciated, what is not, a, what is not approved of. And what's not approved of is gender-based violence. What is approved of is healthy relationships. So these types of messages 
Uh, we can use the platform, the social media to send messages that are positive. In terms of parents, I think I, I can only speak to the United States really, but there's some data on uh, other countries as well. We are giving our young children access to social media at a very early age without the securities and the safeguarding that goes along with it. So it's almost like exposing them to this flood of information without kind of come back, come at it, coming at them with additional resources and information. So we need to monitor that a bit. Our, um, their access and what is it that they're watching? Was it what is it that they're modeling themselves after? And those platforms are incredibly powerful. And we all know that in every country we have the data. So being using the platform in a positive way and also being a bit more mindful in terms of our responsibilities in our communities on, on the youth and children's access to these platforms. Great, thank you so much. Um, Imla Muli, I'm gonna have the next uh, question over for you. Oh, thank you so much. I think I've had an opportunity to view the uh, question and answer section as well. And uh, there's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, for any panelists to answer if uh, comfortable. Uh, this is from Daniel Kotran, and he, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she, but it says, we may have good intentions, but that does not mean what we do will be helpful. And it could even be harmful. So how can organizations like yours collect data that will enable us to say our interventions are actually working. This is especially challenging when we have such high rates of underreporting of gender-based violence. So if I'm not sure who this question was directed to, but uh, I think if anyone is able to answer that. If others aren't answering, I can just quickly speak to the data points. I think if we're implementing any programs, I know CBIM does track that, uh, which means what we do is as we as our coaches go in to deliver the material to the youth, to the adolescent boys, we do a survey of the coaches before they're even trained. And then um, we do a survey of the athletes before they're even um, going through the course, correct? Uh, as a way to assess wh what the baseline is in terms of their uh, attitudes and beliefs and practices on healthy relationships. So then uh, we come back after the, um, the content has been delivered to the young athletes and even after the uh, training has been conducted with the coaches that deliver the content. And we do another uh, survey of the um, those who've been uh, participating and see if there is anything to measure, right, the impact. And this is really important. And that was part of what I was speaking to earlier in that we gotta be able to assess and be very honest and humble about the programs that we're implementing to make sure that what we're implementing is working. And where we see that it's not working, we need to make the adjustment. So uh, all of this is, is critical in that, you know, if you look at violence, in, as a health issue, right? You don't just and compare it uh, in a health analogy. A doctor doesn't just keep prescribing something if what they're prescribing isn't working and it doesn't have a, uh, the results that are intended. So we have to be scientific and methodical about it. So that was a great question and a, an important one. Okay, thank you so much, Leila. I don't know if we still have time to uh, take some more questions. Um, to Anna. I think not. We we are at the hour, and you know we added a half an hour to this, and we still um, could have gone on. I'm sure at least another thirty minutes. So just as we wrap up, um, we want to just share a bit um, of the responses from the mentee and invite you all to continue to add your responses so that we can have that. Um, at the end of your set at this session. Um, again, we hope to be able to answer the questions that were not able to be answered today and we can send them around um, when we send the thank you uh, after this uh, 
call today. But just a few of the um, comments that we have here is enc encouraging the Global Fund, and I imagine others to support AGYW and ABYM integration into their program. I saw a number of comments where people were saying we'd like to hear see boys and girls talking more together. Um, so I think that was really um, a great one. Staying informed and empowering each other, um, creating inclusive and safe spaces. I think those are um, other great real points to make. So I think, um, again, you know, we have a great audience here that has all kinds of wonderful ideas. And so we really would love to have you um, share them. We see establishing platforms for young people to talk. Um, and share their experiences. So just as we wrap up, I, again, I want to thank all of our um, presenters. I do want to address one question. People uh, made several comments in the chat about adults needing to get out of the way. And I love that because I really believe that. And I also believe in leading by example. So I'm so happy to have co-facilitated and co-moderated this session with a delightful young man from Zimbabwe because we lead by example. So we um, involve young people in all of the work that we're doing. This is also a key tenant in the work at USAID, which you will hopefully be hearing more about in the near future. And so again, there's nothing for them without them. And so I'm glad to have so many young people on the call um, joining us today. So any final words from you, Imla Muli? Well, I just want to thank everyone who participated in this uh, webinar session. And I really enjoyed the session because we managed to uh, at least uh, I, uh, talk about a, a lot of issues uh, pertaining to adolescent boys and young men. And uh, now we can uh, always continue fighting for the uh, inclusion in, in such issues uh, that are affecting us. So uh, really thank you to everyone also and to those who are tuned in. I really hope to participate in other sessions, in other webinars where we talk about uh, various issues uh, in our societies. So thank you to everyone. Great, thank you all. Um, we hope to see you again soon, thank you.